the man is complex, um, but brilliant. And the story is going from lost boy to national treasure. And I think it's only something you can do in the sort of 20th century, early 21st century. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. It was over a delicious lunch, nearly three and a half years ago now, that Paul Beaver first told me about the biography he was working on about his friend, Eric Brown, Winkle to the World, and arguably the greatest test pilot that's ever lived. The book is finally out, and... It's fantastic. I really enjoyed it. So I grabbed this opportunity to sit down with Paul and we just have a chat in this episode about his friendship with Winkle, his incredible wife, Lynn, and just tell some stories about the man and delve into the book as well. We don't go chapter and verse. We don't start talking overly technical because the book is a very human book looking at a complex man. And Paul's done a great job pulling it apart. So I'm going to stop waffling. Ladies and gentlemen, the fabulous Paul Beef. So, like like we were saying on the phone, really, I I adored it. Thank you for letting me read oh, it early. Huge it's, pleasure. It's um, considering, I think we've been chatting about this for three years now, haven't we? Well, I've been, actually, if I think about it, it's been six years in the gestation. Um, COVID mm. didn't help, of course, um, mainly because you know, Penguin, like all all businesses sort of slowed down or changed direction um, or whatever. But I think the the key was that once I started doing the research, I found it wasn't a simple job. It wasn't just rehashing wings on my sleeve. It actually required a lot of due diligence and in going into primary sources. So therefore, it was um, a, a six-year project. I think that, you know, the timing... Uh, actually was right. I should have I should have known the timing was going to be right. I should have known it was going to be easier than um <laughs> uh, than you know than than just dashing off a you know a book like Spitfire Evolution, you know, which, which took a month. Um you know so um yeah I had to grow up quickly. I think I've whittled everything down in this book to just one question. Mm-hmm. You you knew Eric for, for 40 years mm-hmm. and he was quite keen for you to do his biography after he passed, of course. What did the things that you found in your research tell you about your friend that you didn't know? I found out a lot I didn't know um, about Eric. I found that, and I never called him Winkle. I always called him Eric. The very first time I met him in November 1978, I think it was, um, I said, what do I call you, sir? And before he could answer, his wife, Lynn, said, who had the most beautiful Northern Irish accent, she said, Paul, he's called Eric. None of this other W stuff. <laughs> so he was always Eric um, to me. And there were other people, you know, including various first sea lords of, of horse called him Winkle. Um, he was very much um, Eric. So the key question, what did I find out? Oh, Matt, I found out so much. He was more than his autobiography gives out. The man is complex, um, but brilliant. And the story is going from lost boy to national treasure. And I think it's only something you can do in the sort of 20th century, early 21st century. I mean, I just think it's an amazing story and it reflects our time and our age and the attitude that people have. So let's get to, to the nub. Should we get to the nub of this? I mean, the, let's do it. the first thing I did was I got his service record, what the, the Navy called his S206. And that gave me a different date of birth and a different place of birth. And I thought, this is interesting. He's a year younger than I thought. So I then said to his family, you don't happen to have a copy of this birth, birth certificate. And they said, well, we've got this. It's a bit ragged, but yes, have a look at this. They scanned it, sent it to me. And I looked at it and I thought, there's a lot wrong with this birth certificate. So I was able to send it um, to the registrar in Alwa in Scotland and say, could you kindly have a look at this for me, please? 
Within 30 minutes, she came back and said, we've had a look. He's, of course, a great Scot. And, of course, for about two years before, he'd just been declared the greatest Scot of the 20th, 20th century. Sorry about that, Mr. Salmon and Miss Sturgeon. And um, he, she said, we can count at least 27 alterations. We can count probably five absolute forgeries. And I have to tell you that this person was born in London. So a bit more due diligence. Find some of the family who then turn out not to be the family because guess what? Eric's adopted. Um, and there were, at the time I was doing the research in 2016, 17, there were still a number of, of people um, alive who remember um, the stories from the 1930s. So in a nutshell, Eric is born at the Salvation Army uh, Hospital in Hackney. Um, he's a Cockney, he's not a Scot. Um, and he was put on a train by the National uh, Child Adoption Agency, no longer exists, to Scotland, where there were no laws about adoption until about 1936. Um, a, a notice was put in the Scotsman, which said families of good repute um, might be interested in the NS NCAA um, train arriving at Waverley Station on the, I can't remember the date now, in February 1920. Um, and Euphemia and Robert Brown, a childless couple living in Leith, he was a journeyman tailor, um, they were tipped off by a relative who worked in the station, and they wanted a boy. And when they arrived, there was only one cot left. There was only one little boy screaming his head off, nobody, nobody taking any interest. And that was Eric Brown, or that was Eric um, surname unknown, mother Dorothy, no father's name. And from there, I had to start building the story. And so the first thing, of course, you do is you look at all that and you ring the family and you say, did you know? And, and his son, Glenn, said, no, of course not. No, no, everything is in wings on my sleeve is what we believe. I said, oh, I'm going to do a bit more due diligence on this. So I get his father's service record. And find his father was not a pilot in the Royal Flight Corps or in the Royal Air Force. And all this retired wing commander or retired rather um, flight lieutenant, retired squadron leader on various certificates, all completely made up. Um, so there's a huge amount of that. So the next question, I think, is does that, does that, does that in some way um, take away uh, anything of Eric's greatness? And the answer is no. Actually, to me, it adds to it. In the 1930s, we might have been horrified. Um, but to me now, today, I look at that and I go, wow, foundling on Waverley Station, Edinburgh, to the greatest test pilot in the world, I think, without any doubt, certainly our greatest pilot, um, you know, the, 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 the records speak for themselves, 487 types, all checked, all verified. 2,407 debt landings, checked, verified. 2,271 launches, checked, verified. Time in Germany before the war, meeting UDET, checked, verified. Um, going through all of, the, all of these things, the only thing I can't quite place him, and I say this in the book at the Olympic Games in 1936, because I've got his mm -hmm. passports. I've got his school reports. I've got his service record. I've got his father's service record. Um, I've got addresses. I've been through the, um, the various documents. That the Scots are brilliant when it comes to, to keeping records. They're superb. Um, so I've got all the school uh, material. I've talked to the school. I've talked to um, the Schloss in, um, in Zalem in, in Germany, found that he actually wasn't going there. In 1939, he was actually going to the Elysee Supérieure at Metz in France. He just took a roundabout route to get there in his MG. Great photographs, an MG with a, um, a swastika on the on the bonnet and a Union flag. <laughs> not, not stupid. Identify yourself as British, but, but you know, being acquiescent to the system. You know, that's what, what you did. 
interestingly, the MG's registration starts SS. Just surely, <laughs> you know, you just start looking at these things, and um, and then I get uh, I get some lucky breaks. I find some people um, who knew about the student swap in 1939 between Britain and Germany, which allowed him to leave. Can you imagine if Eric Brown had been interned in? on the 3rd of September, 1939, um, and had never been in, in the war, we would have never had that great test pilot. Um, and the fact he went to the Royal Navy, the fact that he started off as a naval seaman second class. So I'm really sorry, the good burghers of Edinburgh, your statue at Edinburgh Airport is somewhat misleading in, its, um, in what's... Uh, what's written there. You know, you've got all of these things, Matt, you, you go through, um, which I think makes makes two things. It makes a biography compelling because the research has been done, but it makes the character even more um, compelling. And, you know, it, it, it's, who didn't he meet in the 20th century? You know, every, every just about everyone. And, and there's this great line, um, which I don't actually think is in the book in the end. I think it was edited out. But it was uh, dinner party, 2009. Um, Phil O'Dell um, and a few other um, uh, uh, test pilots um, uh, and, and me. You'd have to be either a display pilot or a test pilot to be there. Um, I only qualify on the display pilot bit. Um, and I'm sitting next to Eric, the conversation dips as conversations do at dinner parties, it's only 12 of us. And Eric says, of course, well, the second time I met Hitler, um, to which Phil O'Dell falls off his chair almost and goes, what do you mean the second time? What was the first? And, you know, it, we, we almost, well, I wanted to call the, the biography the second time I met Hitler, um, but, <laughs> but Penguin thought that was more for an autobiography uh, rather than a biography. But... Um, uh, and it, it's just fun stuff like that. And slowly, slowly, in the last few years, probably 2013 to 2016, um, I saw a lot of Eric. I got more and more out of him. Uh, the whole Civil War thing in Spain. Really, really interesting. Can't really firm that up other than entries in his flying logbook and odd notes. So I've got 12 cases of notes. Um, I've got pictures, photo albums. I've got memorabilia, badges, um, all sorts of stuff um, that I've been going through and using. So I'm pretty sure I know Eric Brown better than anyone, certainly better than anyone in his family, probably better than anyone who actually served with him because I've, I've delved into the man. That's the whole point of writing a biography. It isn't a list of aeroplanes flown. It's not wings on my sleeve. It is absolutely the biography of Eric Melrose Brown. Uh, of course, originally christened Eric Brown. The Melrose was introduced at school because there was another Eric Brown. And there are a lot of Browns around in the borders. And he's a boy from Gala Shields, not Melrose, Gala Shields. Um, the people in Gala say, Brown is not a common surname. It's just a well-liked one. So lots of people have it. <laughs> and I love that, that, that sort of sense too. I mean, he's definitely Gala Shields boy. He's Edinburgh's boy as well in the, 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 um, the university and the Royal High School. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot there, um, uh, Matt. And, and I've rambled a bit, but, but I have to tell you, I, I could talk for hours about Eric. Well, I'm going to keep you for at least one of those <laughs> hours and, and get as much of it out as, you, as I can. I think you've nailed it with what you've just said and with the book is Eric the man is far more interesting than a lot of the things that he managed to do in the aircraft. The technicalities are, are fascinating, but the man himself really came to life because I never had the pleasure of meeting him. I've only you know seen, seen the interviews, read, read his book um, and chatted to good people like yourself a, a, about him. But there was something about reading that first chapter about him being an orphan and myself being the son of uh, a Bernardo's boy, a lot of things clicked into place, especially later in his career with his irascibility yeah. with seeing senior very, figures yeah, as well. Irascible. Absolutely. It, there, there was a lot of it made sense. And I think 
understanding that about him, that he was, he had this inane need to push forward, I think that sort of explains so much. And perhaps with the stories of the family of, you know, his father, a squadron leader, think, think things like that didn't chime quite right. But then once you start unpicking those layers, like you said, a lot of things start slotting into place. I, I think, you know, only child, um, I think no doubt, um, needed to prove himself. I don't think he knew until much later in his life that he was he was adopted. I think the changes in the birth certificate may well have been, and actually this isn't in the book, but it may well be in the second edition, which I hope there'll be, um, is that he was selected to play rugby as an international under 17 uh, or under 16 for the Scottish Rugby Union. And I think in 1936, that sort of period, you needed to ha have be Scottish by birth. I can't see any other reason um, uh, mm -hmm. for doing it. He certainly didn't need it in the Navy. I mean, the Navy knew all his naval papers, say, born 1920, not 1919, as he would say, um, uh, born London. Um, you know, it, it, even his early passports, say, 1920 in London. It all gets very confusing when you start to pile them up. Um, but, you know, it, it was good to find out that he'd learned to fly under the civil um, system in 1938 down in uh, Westmoreland in Kent. Um, I was able to track down his instructor, um, who taught uh, the lady who taught him aerobatics, so important when you're going to be a fighter pilot. A um, lot of good stuff there. Um, he didn't learn to fly at Edinburgh University, the Air Squadron, or anything like that, uh, mainly because mm. there wasn't a university air squadron, which is a good reason for not, not flying there. The, the, air, the air units, there were two that stood in Cambridge before the war. Um, by about 1941, I think Edinburgh had got one, but um, by, by that stage, 1941, he was a fighter pilot. He's an ace, by the way, as well. Um, so, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. He never ever called himself an ace. Um, he was the most, probably the most decorated uh, pilot, and then we get on to the whole thing of, so why did he not get a knighthood? And that's mm -hmm. quite complex. That's to do with his nature, the way he rubbed up the civil service, um, the way he upset Dennis Healy, um, uh, calling the Secretary of State for Defence in a meeting, minuted meeting, uh, a communist, um, even though uh, it was correct because, of course, Healy had been a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain um, when he was um, some low-deck person in the Navy. Just doesn't go well. It was Healy who stopped his next job after Lossy Mouth in 1970 because he'd been slated to be the naval advisor um, in Washington, the British Defence Staff, uh, where he could have continued the fleet air arm connection with the US Navy. I mean, the US Navy and the fleet air arm uh, or Naval Air Command in, in America and the and the Fleet Air Arm were for 30 years hand in glove. And a lot of that is to do um, with uh, with Eric and his personality and what he did, you know, selecting the Phantom and things like that. And I, I think that's the other thing that sort of jumps out is those liaison roles. He manages so much better than, say, as, as in, in, in command yeah. of squadrons and things like that. I, I wanted to ask, as you knew her, how much do you think that was down to Lynn? Because she sounds the most remarkable lady that in those sort of diplomatic arenas, he had a lot more support than he may have had on his own on the squadrons. Well, I, 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 I write in the book, um, in the chapter about when they're in Bonn, um, she spoke Bonnerish German. She learned it very quickly. She spoke the local patois. Eric spoke Hochdeutsch. So, you know, Derek would, um, uh, Eric would ask, um, you know, uh, the, the equivalent would be, um, I say, five fellow, can you direct me to the train station? And she'd say, where's the station? And I think <laughs> that made a difference. But she charmed the German naval staff in 1956, 57, 58, 59, 60, that period when Germany had come out of, um, of the horrors of the Second World War, reforming its armed forces, so vital to us in NATO. And the Germans are pretty proud people. You know, they, um, Hitler lost the war, not the Germans, was the sort of 
attitude that the German staff had. I think she she did remarkably well. I used to really enjoy her company. She was about the same height as as, as Eric. Um, very bubbly, very effervescent. Go to the Hanover Air Show. This sticks in my mind. It's not in the book, but it absolutely sticks in my mind. Ela in Hanover. Um, I must be about 84, 85. And MBB helicopters, Measure Smith Balko Room helicopters, now part of Airbus, are hosting Eric because he was then the Helicopter Club of Great Britain, British Helicopter Advisory Board, FAI, um, Senior, all the all these good things. I mean, he was Mr. Helicopter. Um, and, and I got invited along for various reasons. And, and, and then goes, ah, oh, Paul, great. Now, we're going outside to watch Zimmerman fly. He's going to loop the Balco. So we went outside to see Charlie Zimmerman do um, the most amazing flying display. Which was great because that in, got me introduced to Charlie Zimmerman. Um, I was uh, a very junior uh, reservist territorial officer in the Army Air Corps going through flying training to meet the great Zimmerman was fantastic. So I owe Lynn a lot as well. And I did enjoy her, her company. Um, she would always allow me to open the champagne because um, you always had to have champagne when you went there. That was the other thing. That, that, that I mean, I was talking... Um, uh, just recently. They sound like people after my Yeah, you'd love them. Really. You'd love them. I mean, I, I was talking to Jenna Gearing, the, the sculptor who sculpted Winkle for both the National Gallery in Scotland and uh, Fleet Arrow Museum. Uh, and in fact, I have the, the resin cast of one of those on, on my desk. And uh, Jenna said the thing that she, as a 21 year old, you know, doing her very first commission um, as a sculptor, she's asked, you know, uh, gin tonic or champagne before almost before saying you, you know, would you like to sit down um so uh, uh, she thought it was he was fab and he he they were both charming they were a power couple we'd call them today i mean lynn in the first in the second world war um it was the force's favorite on on the light service i think it was called uh, well, today we call that radio two i think um the bbc in northern ireland doing forces favorites singing, so you know, Lance Corporal um, O'Donovan uh, wants to be remembered to his family in, in Belfast and, and wants to sing X. And so she would do the intro and then she'd sing the song. Um, and that got them actually to meet Glenn, you know, I mean, to, you know, to Glenn Miller. The whole of this Glenn Miller thing um, is actually not Eric, it's Lynn that does it. And, and she sang with the Glenn Miller band the night before Glenn Miller takes off and, and uh, or the last concert they do. It may not be exactly the night before, but just before he, he's killed. And um, Eric is so incredibly hurt by the fact that, that you know, hang on, I'm, you know, me, I'm the chief naval test pilot. You know, I'm the one with the medals. <laughs> you know, I'm an ace that he's allowed to play the second drums. And guess what I've got? I've got the drumsticks. So, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's little things like that that I think are, are, are just fabulous. The book is peppered with them, and it just it rounds out the man so much. And and Lynn, I, I came I came away really wanting to have met Lynn. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's, it's, he really disliked. Like she was a better skier. I mean, she down. <laughs> um, you know, and, and when he was still you know, um, sort of plowing away. She was she was off uh, and gone. And in a cocktail party, she had the most beautiful blonde hair, sparkling blue eyes, great personality, and a red dress. Fantastic. <laughs> I can remember, I can remember her I, I'm being overawed by this. This She was so confident. Um, and she gave him confidence. And I think, actually... Um, she she sort of starts to convert him from Martinet and there's all the hassle over the Helicopter Club of Great Britain and things like that, which I, I, I write about in the book. Um, and then we get we get into the whole process um, of of him retiring. What does he do? He's already been a bear with a sore head in 1970 um, when the uh, the Navy don't want him uh, anymore. And, you know, they didn't want a lot of people then. It wasn't just picking him out. And then he gets to the end of the career. What's he going to do next? You know, well, might update Wings on my sleeve, uh, which I I should say 
he didn't write. Uh, Kenneth Pullman uh, was the author of that, the, uh, the Admiralty author, which, which is in the book. Um, uh, and it was a propaganda book, uh, propaganda story. But he, you know, once these myths are there, they've got to continue. So you'll see stuff on YouTube, and you'll see Eric, you'll see, see frick with heck, you'll see um, uh, Radio 4 Desert Island Discs. You know, I was born in Leith in 1919, he says. No, he wasn't, you know. Um, and um, the myths and legends, I can forgive all of that because it just makes the story more interesting. And he becomes a national treasure. And the thing that I loved about what he did, and I can see that from the letters which I've got, is um, the Bishop's Wartham, small little town in Hampshire, aviation group, write to him and say, would you come... Um, We've just formed, it's a sort of ad hoc group of 60 people. A lot of us are uh, uh, air traffic controllers from Shanwick. Uh, uh, not everyone's got military experience. Not everyone's a bit pilot. In fact, very few are. Um, but we have an aviation group. We, we meet once a month. Would you come and talk to us? And would you come and be our patron? So, of course, he said yes. Um, and now we have a patron's night. I am now the patron of the Bishop's Wartham. Aviation group sort of following on succession with, with Eric. It's fab. Um, and I go and talk about Eric. And I go and just let them into the yet something else that I, I found out. You know, ge flying German jets. Of course, that's mm. going to be so important this summer when the Measure Smith 262 comes over from, uh, from Germany. You know, we're going to be talking German jets again. Eric and the German jets. He flew at least seven of the 262s, including the two seat night fighter. Um, version. There's only one left, and that's in, in South Africa now. Um, he's a man that I thought in Wings on My Sleeve was two-dimensional. He's very much a three-dimensional man. Um, he has a really strong character. And what I wanted to do was create a book that not just you and I, Matt, would read because we know who he is, but maybe some people who'd never heard of him will read and go, what an amazing guy. Do, do we make these people anymore? Where do we make this guy from? You know, how do we create this? How, in what country in the world? I suppose there are a few. America probably is an example. You can, I, I throw, I throw Canada in. There okay, well. Canada. Be, 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 get, throw me a bone. Okay, yeah. throw you a, a bone, Canada. Um, <laughs> sorry, where's Canada? No. Um, yeah. And um, <laughs> you, you, know, you can go from being a foundling um, up to being the most famous pilot in the world. I mean, uh, in what? Um, so he, yeah, it's less than 60 years. I mean, after 1970, he never flew again as pilot in command. He did a lot of flying. I mean, he flew, flew with Airbus in the A380 to give them a hand with some, some trials. Um, you know, more because I think they wanted just an, that, that other opinion of somebody else who'd had real issues taking an aircraft um, into the transition zone before you get to the speed of sound, things like that. Amazing. How amazing. What a privilege to have known him for so long and to have eaten and drunk with him and been down the, the Duke's Head uh, pub in Copthorne with him and introduced him to people. And then he introduced me to people. I mean, I wouldn't have known the Sikorsky family if it hadn't been, you know. And I, I spent a lot of time doing helis, you know, for, for Janes and, and for Helicopter World and things like that. Amazing. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with one of our two uh, Sikorsky Dragonflies. The Dragonfly was one of the first helicopters to go into service with the U.S. military, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy use them. This one was used by the Coast Guard. Um, it was the first helicopter used by the Coast Guard. They were heavily used to kind of set up doctrine for search and rescue for the Coast Guard. So a lot of what went forward with more modern and powerful helicopters after this was all stuff that they learned using the Dragonfly. Um, this one did do a, a stint on one of the Coast Guard icebreakers because um, they usually had helicopter support with those. It's interesting to take a look at these earlier helicopters that used World War II style piston engines, like this one had a Pratt & Whitney R98. So it limited a lot of the payload these types of helicopters could take. So 
it really was until you started having turbine engines and helicopters, like starting with helicopters like the Huey, that helicopters were actually able to start carrying larger amounts of troops and carry more equipment and more crew, weapons, etc. But this is one of the ones that started it all, like with the Bell and some of the other early helicopter designs. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. One of the questions is, was it a relief when you were doing all the checks on the types and the landings and, and things like that, that they all did tally up? Because with some of the stories that sort of grew over time, those numbers adding up must have been, I don't want to say a relief, but must have been very concrete that he was taking very careful records while he was, while he was on the So um, he did, um, the Guinness Book of Records do, does due diligence. And there was a lot of that. There was another Navy pilot, McWhorter, who was very, ironically, same name as the Guinness Book of Records twins, um, who was very close to him in numbers. Um, uh, the Americans tried to beat him. He used to say uh, their pilot just couldn't cope with it. He, you know, he had to go to a loony bin um, afterwards. I mean, Eric <laughs> is the only non-American person in the Naval Aviation Hall of Fame. So, you know, that's that's a pretty good indicator, I think. Um, and I I thought, well, I'm you know, once you've found out that he's not a Scot, well, he is a Scot. I mean, Cracky couldn't speak when he got to, you know, he had he wasn't talking when he got to Edinburgh. Of course he's a Scot. Um, he just isn't born a Scot. Um, you know, uh, it's, I don't actually think we can take the Scot bit away. We shouldn't take that away. Greater Scotsman of the 20th century, absolutely. Be, be, being mar married to a Scot, I would not dare to tr take his Scottish. Yeah, absolutely away. right. I mean, he was very Scottish, um, although being a lad from the borders, he wore trues and not that other thing that they wear. <laughs> um, and he was very proud of being from the borders, from the Tweed. Um, you know, wonderful valley. It's just such a lovely place. Um, and and he's pretty forthright about it. You know, Scotland should never be independent. It is part of the United Kingdom. You know, all of that, very, very forthright um, about that. But I just thought he was, um, he could be, I saw him go from irascible to national national treasure, I suppose. Um, getting, I got a couple of things wrong once in a discussion with him about P1154 and P1127, uh, Harrier and, 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 and supersonic mm -hmm. Harrier, if you like. Um, and, and he was quite firm and Navy captain in putting me back in my back in my box, but with a smile. Um, and you know, there's some lovely anecdotes in the book about about the, him at Lossy Mouth and uh, with his son Glenn, which uh, which which I think are, are, are really good. I don't want really to give too much away. I want people to buy the book. For oh, of course, yeah. Um, but um, what I love about what Penguins allowed me to do is put a hundred pictures in. So, you know, there are colour plates after colour plates. And what they've allowed me to do is where I had to edit out some little anecdotes, they're back in as captions to the photographs. So that was a really good compromise we got to. The book could have been twice as long. It could easily have been a thousand pages um, about Eric Brown because his life is just so, so remarkable, Matt. I mean... Yeah, you know, where's the new Eric Brown out there? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, how do you, how do you become chief naval test pilot as an acting lieutenant, Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve Air Branch? You know, that's okay. You know, he and I actually, Eric and I had the same rank for one time. I went to, foolish enough, went, flirted with the navy, and I think I was a probationary temporary acting sub lieutenant at some stage. Well, he was that, but he'd just been before that a rating pilot. Um, and then afterwards, he became uh, a probationary acting sub-lieutenant, which he kept for about three years. He could have been promoted quicker had he have not done a few things which caused their lordship's displeasure. And that was one of the wonderful things about, about reading his S206, where the, oh my God, did take away without aircraft without permission. Um, did uh, cause a hurricane to catch fire. 
um, did low-level aerobatics without permission, um, you know, grounded for two weeks. Thank goodness he was. He, otherwise, he would never have been able to court Lynn. I mean, that was a marriage made in heaven. You know, first girlfriend, married. Uh, you know, she died in 1928. I mean, fantastic. And I think that's what comes across really well. I, I'm looking forward to the final version because I've got the one without the pictures. Ah, uh, <laughs> and so I'm I'm looking I'm looking forward to 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 seeing you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, eight, eight, eight June, the Royal Aeronautical Society, yep. absolutely. And the the thing uh, that point you just made there came across was the fact he was a bit of a boy. Really made me made me happy that. Some of the things that he didn't talk so willingly about the the, the naughtiness that the grand things, which explains the you know the Saunders Row incident as as well. That yeah, if he fancied taking something up or doing something, he just did it. And I I really like that about him. That, I, I, yeah. I love the fact that in 1945 he goes into the Russian zone in Germany with some cigarettes and says to the guys, um, not only do they have some German aircraft, they have Fort Wolf One Eight Seven there, which he wanted to fly. Um, but they also had a Yak-3, you know, kind of go and fly that. It's not authorised. Pack of cigarettes. I've, I've done the same. 1992, Zukovsky in Russia. Yeah. Um, can I look inside the MiG-31? Not authorised. 200 Marlboro. Authorised. Um, and and the, 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 same, the same thing. I mean, I just think it's, um, it, it's very good. He's always prepared, you see. When you're a test pilot, you need to be prepared for, for the what you don't expect to happen to happen. Um, so means of escape. I mean, he used to drum this into me with my, with my flying. Two means of escape. No, walk into a room. Two means of escape. In case there's a fire. Know how you can get out. Um, he used to practice um, rolling um, into a ball. When he was 93, 92, 93, he had a car accident. A lorry backed into his car. He had a, a Peugeot 308 sports car. He liked sports cars. He'd just got his first speeding ticket. Um, a lorry backed into the car on the driver's side. And when the police who were passing ran over, they, they, one constable apparently said to the other, he's a goner, because the, the driver's side was absolutely collapsed. On the, in the car, uh, the passenger well was Eric, curled up, in in the fetal position, in the in the brace, all the impact taken, no ill effects. How about that? How about that? That's amazing, and and I, the the sort of the time again, time and time again, when his shortness of stature saved mm. him. That. that yeah, the, the the nickname Winkle is because he's short, mm. and of course Perry Winkle. Yeah, it's Perry yeah. Winkle. Mm. And, 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 yeah. and American the, asked me um, why why we would give such a horrible nick uh, American woman uh, why such a horrible nickname to our greatest pilot. I had to explain it was Perry Winkle. It's nothing to do with anything in the um, uh, in, in the, the other in the other regions. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just thought how you know God's truth. Save me, um, but the um, the fact that you know he was he was short enough to fit into things cockpits BF one hundred and nine, um, Rado actually Rado had quite a bit of space really, um, even the early Spitfires, um, the Sea Fire definitely. I mean, you know, you've been in a Spitfire cockpit. Um, there's not a lot of room. It's it, yeah, it's not built for someone of of my girth and height. Yeah, it, you know. Um, uh, he he was perfect, but actually, you know, he wasn't that tall. Uh, wasn't that, that out of place? I mean, he wasn't that short for his his size. If you look at his, there's a, there's a picture in the book of some of his um, squadron mates. Um, I've been able to the photographs been in his album, and I've been trying to identify them. Then I did a a book about um, the fleet arm of the Battle of Britain, and I suddenly realised I could recognise the the faces from that, and I've been able to identify them all. Um, they're all about the same, 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, he used to say he was 5'7". His naval record said something different. Yeah. I, I, I interviewed a, a stealth fighter pilot recently who was too tall to be a United States Air Force pilot, and he just said, you learn how to slouch. Yeah. 
and you and you know the regs. So it works both ways. You you either stand tall or you yeah. you hunk, hunker yourself down a little. I bit. recommend Argentine tango to anyone who wants to be taller because if you don't stand, I, I'm just I'm leaning to talk to you. If you don't do that, you know I I've, I've gone up two centimeters since I've been dancing. <laughs> Uh, I, I suffer from an acute lack of rhythm, so my 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 tango days are are not going to happen. I'm afraid, and much to my wife's annoyance. I'm sure she'll get me doing I'll, one of these. Days. Give her my number. <laughs> I have to say that I've I was a bit sad when I finished the book, so I wanted to spend more time with him. And knowing that you probably could have done another volume is is bugging me now because it's I I finished it off on a flight to New York and. I just remember finishing it and thinking, I miss him. That's lovely. And it, it must have been lovely for you to spend these years after Eric's passing to, to get to know him a little bit better. I think I probably got to know him um, in the period before I met him. You know, 1978-ish, mm -hmm. I think I met him. Um, uh, I corresponded with him. Um, and, and typical Eric, I corresponded a couple of times and he went, I think it's best if we discuss this over lunch, dear boy. I, I'm in Surrey. You know where I am. Give me a call. Um, so I gave him a call and I said, right, okay, lunch on Sunday then. You know, no, are you free on Sunday? Lunch on Sunday. Um, so Beaver dutifully troops over uh, and lunch <laughs> turns into afternoon and evening. And uh, lo and behold, you know, there arrive a whole bunch of hoods. Um, Sergei Sikorsky, for example, the son of Eagle, um, and, and a few others, you know, it becomes a bit of a, it becomes a, a really good shindig. Um, and how lovely that was. How lovely that was. Um, and it, it, it didn't look back. But, but actually to do the research on Eric, uh, you know, uh, Eric 1930s Eric, getting his school diary, boy, was he busy. He was, you name the game, he played it. Um, he played snooker, he played cricket, he played rugby. He didn't play that ridiculous game, the 22 players, that, that where they, they all fall on the floor and, and go, ow, and I paid far too much money. Mm. Um, he played proper games. Um, and he was runner-up runner ducks of the school. Um, he was uh, top of his class in many things. Actually, his French was better than his German, but his, his French sort of decayed with the lack of use and... And German, um, his German was, mm -hmm. was then then better. Um, uh, and who he didn't know in the old in the old Germany was was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, so, and of course, we've not talked about. I could have done a, at least two chapters worth on Hannah Reich um, and his relationship with her. There she is. I I was I was going to ask about Hannah because. That's a very, I don't want to say straight, I'll say interesting relationship there because she was an interesting woman. And Strange his woman. I mean, it, it, fascination with her was, it was something else. So I've got, I've got a huge file, sort of, you know, at least that thick um, on, on Hannah, letters and stuff. The one thing there is not is the copy of the last letter she wrote to him before she committed suicide, um, uh, which he sent to her brother and didn't keep a copy of, um, which I regret very much because I'd like to have read that. And I think, um, you know, other, other people um, would have done mm. as well. But, you know, um, he had this, you know, he, he thought she was an amazing um, aviatrix. I mean, there she was, all these gliding records in, in 1930s, you know, age 21, distance record um, from Friedrichshaven down the spine of Italy and back again, things like that. People... Um, you know, a really good pilot, um, a handling pilot like Eric, you know, uh, not like um, uh, Milita von Stauffenberg, who was an excellent test pilot, but she was an engineering test pilot. Everything to her was worked out in, in engineering terms. You know, Claire Mully's um, book um, really separates the two. Um, but Eric never met Milita, um, which I think is a pity, because Eric, although he was an arts grad um, or arts undergrad, because he didn't actually graduate until he got a war graduation in 1947. Um, but he he picked up engineering pretty quickly. And I suppose he had to, you know, to survive. Yeah. He used to spend his, 
I mean, when he was at Farnborough, 44 to, to 49, five years at Farnborough, he rarely took leave. Uh, he would do a bit of sport every now and then, play rugby. Um, but uh, he would then spend his time uh, with the boffins. And I wish I had some of the stuff that they talked about. I mean, I wish I had the, uh, the plan form for Concord drawn on a cigarette packet in building 379 or whatever it was at, at Farnborough, um, or the Vulcan wing shape, uh, all coming from Germany, of course. Um, mm. And uh, I think his admiration for German technology and his admiration for the, the bravery of individual Germans like Hannah Reich, you know, Hannah Wright flew a V1, a manned V1, to see what the problems were with the gyro. <laughs> Potty. I think he, he admired that. He couldn't cope with her adoration um, for Adolf Hitler. Um, I don't suppose any of us can, actually, to be honest. It is strange, <laughs> but it doesn't take away Hannah's abilities. It flew the first, first woman to fly a helicopter inside the Deutsche Halle, um, which he saw. You know, he was there at the right time, the right place. He saw the first Brit British jet fly by just having a weather diversion into Cranwell. You know, I mean, uh, luck, luck plays a huge part in aviation and in surviving in aviation. That's that's always the key. Yeah, it, it's you, you could you could see in especially the way you form and. and the, the relationship they had that that mutual respect and i and i guess for for him as well having been in germany in those sort of formative years of of nazi rule as well that must have been a very interesting conversation he was having with himself while he was talking to to hannah about that how well, she never reconciled ne re, never reconciled with with the fall or the realities of it i'm absolutely right uh, absolutely right i mean he um uh, I, it, I think it's key. Like the country, the language, uh, ironically, the cuisine, um, some of the wines, <laughs> um, which I can agree with him, the Moselles, mm -hmm. for example. Um, uh, not so much. The that beer. was my holiday last summer. No, not so much the beer. Moselles Valleys. Yeah, we, yeah. So, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> um, uh, didn't like the political bit. You know, yeah. couldn't understand it. You know, until the Second World War, you know, like the fact the trains ran on time and the autobahns and all of it, because you could just see that. You, all you see in Berlin, all you saw in Berlin, 38, 39 period, was just a success story. It would today be like going to Beijing. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, I think then going back, I mean, he first went back to Berlin about 10 years after the war, and he was really surprised at the, the devastation, really shocked by the devastation. But he went back and, you know, um, he just said, well, there were Germ the, you, the system has weeded out the Nazis. The German military that are left are German military, just like me, a patriot for your country. Your country needs you. You go and be a submarine commander. So he met the submarine commander who'd sunk audacity, his, his uh, aircraft carrier, you know, and... and killed some of his mates, but that's war. It, it, you know, the parallels are huge, aren't they? Um, you know, it, it still happens. You know, there are, uh, there are still, um, between Argentina and Britain, uh, 41 years after the Falklands, there are still people who, who meet and talk um, uh, and discuss. You know, th there are, um, and there will be more of, of this um, from Iraq and Afghanistan, I'm sure. It's human nature. Because if you're a professional airman, you want to talk, or professional sailor, as, and Eric was very much a sailor, um, you know, a flying sailor, um, you, you, you want to talk to the same the people. You, know, you, you want to talk to your own. I mean, I, I know this from having, having um, done a Russian pilot's license when I, when I had a yak in the 90s, um, going to do a Russian pilot's license in Russia. Um, my Russian was good enough. Their English was almost good enough. Um, I, I succeeded. I didn't kill anyone. Um, but we then spent five hours um, talking about airplanes with not really a lot in common, except we were able to do it. There's a lot of this going on. Um, but we're all pilots. It's great. And 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 it's it's understanding that experience. This is you know when you get to sit in on those conversations. It's this is what I saw. What did, what was it? 
like from from your side it was understanding what yeah. the, the reverse is um and Daniel, i think that's i think that, that that's that's really relevant i mean i think that's uh, he did a lot to bring the Luftwaffe and the uh, Marina Flieger into the system properly. I, if you see in the book, you know, I, I cite some of his reports. You know, as a, he would have made a great diplomat, and certainly when he went to to Bonn um, as naval attaché, um, uh, he did a lot of really good work there, especially when Her Majesty the Queen went on state visit, um, just helping out. Um, with that, there's some pictures in the book of that, which you haven't seen yet, I know. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> I, I think that's enough teasing. People, go out, buy the book. It's fantastic. And um... Well, I, ho- I hope they will. I hope they come. We're, we're going to do a few launches, one in London at the 8th of, uh, 8th of June, um, which is a free event. Um, I just hope you buy the book. Um, Talk Valley History Festival, uh, the Army Flying Museum, I want to go to Scotland and take the book up there because um, you know, good burgers of Galos Shields need to know about their man and, and those in Edinburgh, the Royal High School, etc. So a lot going on. Um, I'm on Twitter, which is probably the place to find out where I'm going to be. So um, you know, at Beaver Westminster. So that's me. What I'll do, I shall put the the Chalk Valley event, uh, your Twitter, all those things in the description. That'd be lovely. The pod, so people can... Thank you. Paul, it's always a delight, and I love the book. Thank, Thank you. you for spending some time with me. A uh, huge pleasure. I'm very happy. Winkle, The Extraordinary Life of Britain's Greatest Pilot, is out today if you're listening to this on their release, which is the 8th of June. As we were talking about in the pod, Paul's going to be doing lots of events coming up, including at the Chalk Valley History Festival, which is a fabulous event, and I'll put the link to his talk in there below. Link to our bookshop where you can pick up a copy, support the pod. There'll be a link to Paul's Twitter and all the other good things in the description to this podcast as well. As always, thank you for your continued support of the show. Tell your friends, leave some reviews, join us on Patreon if you want to. You get these things early, no ads, which are always great. And I just tell your friends, the numbers are going up, which is nice. But we can always have more. And we've got some fantastic stuff coming up. We have a reunion for the Radio 4 adaptation of Len Dighton's Bomber. We've got, next week, we've got Tom Whipple from The Times telling us about his book, The Battle of the Beams, and lots more besides, including those episodes about the 8th Air Force, which I'm sitting on until Masters of the Air finally shows. Hopefully, that'll be soon. Until next time, please do take care of yourselves. Thanks for listening, and have a great week. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.